Okay, let's get started. So I hope you're all in the right place. Uh, spatial analysis and maps with Python. So my name is Christy Heaton. I'm a GIS data analyst at a company, uh, an environmental consulting company in Seattle called Floyd Snyder. I also teach Python and GIS classes at the University of Washington part-time, and I'm a blogger for the Python Software Foundation. I'm also in involved in a lot of community efforts, PyLady Seattle, and I run a meetup group called Map Time Seattle, which you should check out if you're ever in Seattle. We organize monthly workshops and mappy hours, um, all for free, using open source mapping software. Um, so today, we're going to be talking about spatial analysis and maps with Python. This is a novice level tutorial, so I'm not expecting a ton of experience. But I am expecting some Python knowledge, because you've made it to a Python conference. I assume you know some Python, but you don't need to know any GIS, so I'll introduce everything. And there's more information on the presentation page. So today, today's three-hour tutorial is going to go something like this. Um, start off with uh, a talk introducing a lot of concepts and some fun tools that I use all the time. Then we'll go through um, three Jupyter notebooks for the bulk of the middle section. We'll break at 10.15, there'll be snacks outside. Come back, finish up um, our, work our workshop material, and then we'll have some time at the end for finishing up questions, final exercises. So I sent out an email last Sunday uh, with setup instructions. You do need a Conda environment to go through this workshop. So if you have not set that up, um, I guess give it a try <laughs> right now. It could take 10 to 30 minutes to set up the Conda environment. Um, yeah, I think it, it takes less if you like do it multiple times like I did, or if you have a really fast connection. Um, so the repo that you need for today here on GitHub, you can clone or download it. Um, I do have a link to slides, which I, I created that link last night. And um, getting started, instructions are here. If you haven't done it already, it's, uh, it's mostly like non-active work. So if you need to, you can get it started. And hopefully, you'll be ready by the time we start the notebooks. Um, everyone good with that link? OK, so let's get started on my talk. OK, let's talk about maps. Maps are cool. Maps are useful. Um, we, we see maps all over the place. A quick way to visualize information, to visualize a system, like a metro system, for example. Um, you know, you really couldn't understand it that quickly any other way by other than looking at a map. And maps are really cool. There are a lot of really cool web maps right now. Let me show you one. It's my favorite map right now. Uh, it's just a web page on the Washington Post, but it's got this map embedded in it. And it's showing you all the eclipses, all the solar eclipses that will happen in your lifetime. So you can plug in the year you were born, and it will filter out all the eclipses that you can expect to see. And not only is it kind of cool and spinny, but it's interactive. If you hi hover over one of the eclipses, it will like tell you what the date is. You can also drag it around. And hopefully the one that happened last year is here in orange. And maps can also be really beautiful, aesthetically pleasing, artistic opportunities. So I just really love looking at maps. I was on the plane ride over here just looking at the maps and the, uh, you know, like the TV screen. <laughs> Better than any TV show they had. Um, maps can also tell a story. Some, some, some things that require a map, a visualization, um, are best told like over over time, and for that you need an interactive web map like an Esri story map. This is Esri is a proprietary company that makes uh, mapping software and provides a lot of uh, these kind of web map templates that are really easy to make. Um, so, you know, telling the story of the Civil War took place over a long period of time. So you can make maps like this that embed a lot of you know, spatial temporal information and kind of watch battles happen. And 
we use maps all the time. I used a map to walk over here this morning because I'm not m you know, familiar with the area yet. Um, they're embedded into a lot of applications on our phones, even ones that you wouldn't expect. Like sometimes, this hasn't happened recently, but um, sometimes in some of my applications, like a text messaging application, someone will ask me, where are you? And the app identifies that text and prompts me to share my location with them. So you wouldn't expect that in like a messaging app, but it actually is embedded. And you know, of course, getting directions, looking at traffic conditions, um, we use maps all the time on our smartphones. So lots of maps are really new, but maps have been around a really long time. Uh, you know, we've been trying to identify where we are and what's where things are in relationship to what, get directions. So uh, we've been mapping for a really long time. And maps have also been used for problem solving for a really long time. And the first instance we know of this is um, in London. In 1854, a doctor named Jon Snow, um, this was before the Game of Thrones, Jon Snow, yes. Um, he had a cholera outbreak in his area, and at the time they didn't know how cholera was spread. They thought it was spread by breathing in bad air, um, but it's actually caused by drinking water, contaminated drinking water. But he, he suspected that it wasn't the air thing, so he drew a map, and he mapped all his cholera cases in black where they lived, and then he drew a circle around them. And he noticed that there was this pump, this water pump, right in the middle of his circle, uh, the Broad Street water pump, where presumably these people were getting their water source. So he convinced the city council to remove the handle on the pump, and the cholera outbreak died out. So I make maps for a living, and sometimes when I tell people that, they ask me, hasn't everything already been mapped? Um, <laughs> so I'll talk about why that is not even possible. So first, let's make a distinction um, between two different kinds of maps. There are base maps, which are maps that are used for a reference, and then there are thematic maps, which you might see in like news articles and stuff that have some theme associated with them, usually on top of a base map. So a base map could look something like this. This is. Uh, high quality aerial imagery from a company called Planet in Bellevue, Washington. So satellites orbit the Earth, take pictures all the time, and um, they are able to make these really nice uh, imagery base maps that you can, you can use in your maps. So this is imagery based base map. Base maps can also be data based. So this has no imagery on it, but it's got a bunch of layers on top of layers that are styled accordingly at each like zoom level. So um, this is another example of a base map just showing you like where things are. And there are a lot of cool new base maps in the past few years. Um, some that I really like are from a company called Stamen. And this is their website. I really like this watercolor map. Uh, we, we're actually going to use it later. They have a lot of really cool, nice, modern base maps. I used to have a colleague who was always talking about burning stuff. And he really likes this you know, base map where all the roads are on fire. So like, you know, that hadn't been mapped until someone did it. <laughs> So base maps have not all been made because partly there's changes in landscape and infrastructure, political boundaries, so there's always like updates to make. Um, and then you can just take the same data and style it differently, use different colors, style things differently at different scales, and highlight different features. So there are really infinitely many base maps that you could make. So thematic maps, in contrast, are maps with some extra theme associated with them. And that theme is like spatially there, but it's not something you would see from above. It doesn't necessarily help you like know where something is in, in space. Well, it does. But um, So here's an example of a thematic map. So we have a base map, which has state boundaries, county boundaries, just to orient us. But then on top of that, we have this layer showing soil moisture types. So this is an example of a thematic map where the theme is soil moisture. Um, this is a thematic map I made um, kind of early on in my career for the state of Utah. We were mapping broadband coverage 
um, as the providers submitted it to us versus like what people who were driving around actually got. So in Utah, we have some beautiful nat national parks. So I mapped um, Canyonlands National Park and I showed um, what AT&T had submitted us as their coverage versus what someone driving through uh, found the coverage to be. So like, you know, that was a very specific need for us. So that map, of course, hadn't been made. We had to make it ourselves. And thematic maps can also uh, be really creative, not have, you know, there's so infinitely many things to map, like paths taken, ship, ship routes. Um, maps can also kind of ignore all sense of like actual shapes and um, kind of give you bubbles for some kind of variable like population of the world in this case. I would say this is a map. So not all thematic maps have been made because there are infinitely many themes to be mapped, ways to map things, and spatial questions to ask. And we make maps with GIS. Um, so even if like all base maps of Earth and all thematic maps of Earth had been made, um, there's also like planets and solar systems that could be mapped. Um, and even fictional worlds, if you've seen Game of Thrones, you know like there's a map that like pans over in the opening scene. Anyone seen that? <laughs> Um, and then I, you can actually do spatial analysis on fictional worlds. I met someone last summer who was uh, looking at the Lord of the Rings world and trying to map if Frodo had taken the best path to Mordor. So infinitely many themes. <laughs> I don't know. At this point, it's just a funny story to tell. <laughs> so... Um, so what is GIS? GIS is a system that allows you to deal with spatial information, to visualize it, ask questions, analyze it, and interpret it in order to understand spatial rela relationships, patterns, and trends. And it's used in lots of organizations, like I work for an environmental consulting company. It's also used in like NASA and um, like, um, like ho home buying sites, want to know neighborhood information, so it's used um, at lots of like all levels of government as well. Um, and what really drew me to GIS is that it's a fun mix of data science analysis and the pretty maps that I always liked looking at. So we use GIS to answer spatial questions, questions with some kind of where component. So like, how do you get somewhere? How do you get to the zoo? Where is it? How do you get there? Um, where are traffic conditions best right now? Our uh, mapping applications are really getting good at this. Uh, where will I be able to go to see the next solar eclipse? Um, questions like, where should we build the next something? Where should we build the next store? Where should we build the next wind turbine solar panel? You can use spatial data to analyze the best place to put these things for maximum output. Um, you can use it for environmental investigation, where would nitrogen and phosphorus runoff be affected if we change like this organic farm into some kind of commercial real estate. Um, used for uh, weather incidents, where will the hurricane hit and what cities will it, will it be impacted? And then my least favorite where question, where should we place advertisements so that people see them or also the people who are most likely to buy our product, that's definitely one of the uses of GIS. And the this list goes on and on. I just thought of some random questions, but there are infinitely many spatial questions to ask. So GIS, anyone know what it stands for? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> geographic Information System. So geographic has some kind of spatial component. It's related to where, it, where something is on the Earth. Information, in as far as like non-spatial attributes, like the state of Ohio has non-spatial attributes like population and who the governor is. A system is all the moving parts that allow you to deal with that kind of information. So all in all, GIS is a system that allows you to store, process, and visualize information that has some spatial component. So in order to do GIS, you need these five things, people, spatial methods, analyzing methods, spatial data, special hardware and software. So for people, these are the users and creators of the GIS, people like me sitting at a desk doing GIS all day, 
Um, we ask spatial questions. We design methods in order to answer those questions. And then we make maps of our results and share them, give them to either our boss or put them in a paper or put them online. Um, GIS has some spa special analysis methods, so things that have to do with like the shape of something, um, making a buffer, like maybe we want to buffer all the rivers to find out what's on either side of them, um, clipping stuff, so maybe we want to find all the river, river buffers that are inside of Ohio, we could clip, clip that data, yeah. Um, like say you have a river that's just a line and you want to know like what's within five feet of it, you could buffer that shape in order to get that information. And just other like types of spatial transformation, they get really complex. So you need special data, data that has a spatial component, and this kind of data can be stored in a file or a database. So some examples of files that um, have spatial information are shape files. These, this is an open source format. It was initially a proprietary format created by Esri, but now it's open source, and we're actually going to be using shape files today. They're like uh, e five to six files with the same name but different extensions. Um, anyway, and then you can also store it in a, a database, PostGIS database, or um, other databases have spatial capabilities. Um, for to do GIS, you need special software. So you need an operating system, of course. And then on top of that, you need some kind of mapping application. QGIS is the open source mapping application that is most used. But there are also proprietary mapping applications like ArcGIS and MapInfo. Uh, we're going to be using Jupyter Notebooks as our um, mapping application today. <laughs> so I should have put the little icon on there. And you also need hardware, something, some kind of computer server to run your mapping software. Um, depending on what you're doing, you might also need a scanner, scan in stuff to digitize, plot stuff on a big piece of paper, or a GPS unit if you're going to do GPS data collection. So the result of all that is maps. And that's the way we display our GIS data. Web maps are a kind of a whole different beast. They have, um, they'll have some kind of base map associated with them. And we're going to look at that a little more later, um, and then they'll have some kind of thematic layer on top of it. But they're also dynamic, so <laughs> go away. Um, they have like dynamic elements, so you can turn layers on and off right there in the browser. And then they use base map tiles, which I'll show you later. And then those tiles are cached, and then you might also have live data sources and web services that are getting called when you click on a, a web map. So um, yeah, web maps are whole different animal. So GIS data is a little bit different than like a tabular data. It's got some extra stuff that you need to think about. So let's look at some ways that it's special. So there are two types of data that we use in GIS, vector and raster. Vector data is, um, you, it can come in these shape files. This is, we're going to be working with vector data today. It represents discrete entities, so points, lines, and polygons. So vector data might have point data representing tree locations or bus stops. Line data might represent roads, rivers. Um, polygons might represent parcel boundaries or state boundaries. And then in contrast, raster data is for modeling um, some feature that e everywhere on Earth has a value, so like um, Digital elevation model is a raster that has uh, equally sized cells, that every cell has an elevation value. So they're image formats, regularly sized cells where every cell has a value of whatever you're modeling. So when you deal with vector data, you might load it into a mapping application, bring in a bunch of layers. You'll be able to turn them on and off on top of each other. When you bring in a, um, a vector data set into a mapping application, this is just a snapshot of QGIS, you get a spatial component and you also get a tabular format. So I just brought in um, some state data and I opened up the um, non-spatial attribute table associated with it, which is tied to it. So I opened up this table and I found Ohio and I clicked on Ohio and that also selected the Ohio on my map. So spatial and um, tabular data are tied together. 
So raster data, in contrast, is uh, an example is the, the digital elevation model, like I mentioned. So it's an image with pixels. Every pixel has an elevation value. And the US has a national land cover database, which is also an example of a raster data set where every pixel has a land cover designation. So everywhere on Earth has a land cover designation, which is why this makes a good raster format. And if I load the national uh, land cover database into my map, um, I don't get that same kind of like tabular connection that I did with the vector data. Instead, every cell that has a 42, which is uh, evergreen forest, if I click on that 42, it'll select all the cells that, are, that have that designation. Aerial imagery is another example of raster data because it's just a picture. Every cell has a color as taken from satellites. So other things to consider are data acquisition. You need uh, special data if you're going to do GIS. Um, OpenStreetMap, we're going to look at that quite a bit later, but it's a, it's a really cool data source, community-supported data source. And there are, um, there's also like census data. We'll give you lots of data about people um, then lots of data out there. Um, you can probably also pay for data, pay some proprietary source. Lots of data is available. Some common data sources are government, census, crowdsource like OpenStreetMap, or proprietary sources, or you could collect it yourself. Um, data quality is a big thing to think about. You definitely want to know your source and trust your source, and then when you're writing up your report or you're making your map, you want to cite your source, so theoretically anyone could go reproduce what you did and come up with the same results. So scale is another thing to consider because, you know, it's really up to you what scale you want to use in your map. You could be zoomed in, you could be zoomed out. Um, so scale is how many inches on your map represent one real world mile. Um, and you need to think about how much information you want to show at what scales. And you also want to have a scale bar on your map sometimes. So if you remember base maps, this is, um, this is the same area, but I zoomed in at different levels. So this map is highly customized to look good at different zoom levels. And you'll notice over here we're zoomed way out. We have state boundaries and city cities with dots. We don't see any, um, ro we see roads, but they're like just the major roads and they're really fine lines. But it, once we zoom in, it's styled totally different. The roads are now, this road is really thick because it's important and big. And we see um, out building outlines. And smaller roads have, you know, like a width associated with them. So uh, styling different things at different scales is very important. So data collection and GPS. Uh, GPS is these satellites orbiting the Earth. And you can collect data in this way by uh, going out to whatever you need a, the spatial location for with your GPS unit and taking a bunch of points. It'll the Satellites will triangulate your position to a high accuracy. So this is a common way of data collection. Um, we use it where I work now. We use it where I work um, to like, if there's a well and we need, we have some samples from it, we need the exact location of it so that we can put it on a map with other wells. So the Earth is not flat, despite what some people think. Um, so that's a really important thing to consider when dealing with spatial data. So uh, we can't really work with it in in its like round state because we're all working on these flat either pieces of paper or flat computer screens. So we need to deal with that somehow. So um, there's a lot of math involved in projections, but basically, you know, the Earth is kind of a wobbly object. It's not a perfect sphere. So in order to model it, um, they make a geoid of it, which is like an equi equipotential surface. Um, so from there, <laughs> um, they draw a nice kind of ellipsoid around it. That way, like from that kind of a shape, we can begin to like do math to model it. And then from there, you can flatten it out in different ways, um, make it a flat surface. And no matter how you do this, you're going to have some kind of distortion. If you imagine taking a grapefruit and like peeling it off, 
flattening it out, it's going to look funny. It's going to be problem. There are going to be problems. So that's the same kind of thing that um, your flat maps of the Earth have to deal with. Uh, so there have even been ways of modeling di different kinds of distortion, but basically the things that get distorted are areas, um, angles, and shapes of boundaries and things, um, distances from one place to another, and then the direction on your map might be off, depending on what projection you use. Um, so EPSG.io is a database that holds a bunch of different pr coordinate systems which are tied to projections, and we're going to be using this database. This is what GeoPandas is going to want us to tell it what co our data coordinates are in. So um, I think I have this open. So if you go to this website, you can type in a four-digit code, which um, we'll use this one in a little bit. But I noticed that um, when I got in here to Ohio, it it's now giving me this click to see coordinate reference systems for Ohio. So we can see like, oh, there's some that are appropriate. So that's helpful. OK, so some examples of projections are the World Mercator projection. And this one probably looks somewhat familiar to you because this is what Google Maps uses. This is what almost all web maps use. And in the Mercator projection, these straight lines that you see on the map are actual straight lines. So this was a map that was um, used a lot for sea navigation because they could follow one of these lines and get where they needed to go. Um, used in web maps, I think, um, because it's conformal, so shapes are preserved. So like some projections, if you zoomed in on the Large Hadron Collider, it would like squish it. But this projection makes it keeps it a nice circle. So shapes are preserved for this projection. But at the poles, you get huge distortions in size. So Antarctica looks way bigger than every other continent. In actuality, it's quite small. Same with the northern latitude continents. And here's just a snapshot of uh, Google Maps. So it's using the some kind of Mercator projection. The polar stereographic projection is cool one. It's only, uh, only the center is true to scale, so if you're trying to map one of the poles, this might be the one you want to use. And there are lots of other projections. There are so many that, um, that you've probably seen, but we're going to only be using a few today. Feel free to poke around at other projections. So we talked about how um, different um, Different projections uh, have different kinds of distortion. And there's this tool called projectionwizard.org where you can go and like tell it the distortion property you want to preserve, um, tell it the area you're trying to map, and then it'll give you some pr guidance on what projection to use. So coordinate systems are closely tied to projections, especially how we're going to use them today. So coordinate systems are how we define a location on the Earth. And just like in geometry, you have a, a plane with the origin, and then you have two points that allow you to find your location. Um, so coordinate systems for the Earth can either be um, geographic or unprojected. So we're modeling it based on the spherical Earth, or they can be based on a projection. So WGS84. Uh, is a geographic or unprojected coordinate system that we're going to use today. And this is latitude and longitude. You've probably heard of those things. Um, so this is the coordinate reference system that those are defined in. This is what GPS uses to express locations. This is the only format GeoJSON files can be in. Um, the EPSG code is 4326. We'll use that later. And fun fact, the lat long of Cleveland, Ohio is 41, 49, 81, 69 west. So um, another thing about this coordinate system is it has an origin that's actually on the Earth. Um, it's this, this coordinate system is divided by the equator and the prime meridian. Um, so there's actually a 0, 0 here on the Earth. And a lot of times when you're loading in data, you're bringing in coordinates. And some of, some of your uh, records don't have a location, so they come in as 0, 0, and they all get plotted to Null Island, which is not a real place. but we GIS people know it well. Um, 
So another thing with uh, the geographic unprojected coordinate system, it's, it's based on the spherical Earth. So, um, so when we are going to be, um, we're going to be using it, and it's going to look flat to us, so how that doesn't make any sense. So it is actually getting projected. When you try to project the WGS84, it usually gets projected into this projection called Plat Curry, and it looks like this, and we'll see it in our Jupyter notebooks. Another coordinate system is the Universal Transverse Mercator, used quite a bit. Separates the Earth into 60 zones. Uses a transverse Mercator projection behind the scenes, so this is a projected coordinate system. State plane coordinate system, it's what we use at my current job. Um, each US state is separated into zones. Some states only have one zone. Uh, but these uh, coordinate systems are highly optimized for these particular scales. Alaska has like one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, and the projections behind these coordinate systems vary based on the shape of the system. Okay, so now you know all about GIS, all the good stuff. There's a few caveats, just things to think about. Maps are models and all models are wrong because you can't incorporate the complexity of the real world into any kind of model. So everything's gonna have some kind of distortion. Depending on the projection you use, the sizes of what you're seeing might not be consistent. Lines might, that you draw on your map might not actually be straight lines on the real world. Areas might be distorted. You also might have some data issues. You know, data, bad data in is going to equal bad results out. So be sure you're using the highest data possible and that you trust your source. Um, maps can also be used intentionally to mislead. You could make whatever you're trying to map like look really bad or really good tone it down to make it seem not so bad. Um, so that happens. And even a very good model is still a simplification of reality. So even this really beautiful aerial imagery is not actually how the world looks because, um, so I told you the little microsatellites orbit the Earth and take pictures. Um, and they actually use Python, I think, to identify uh, pictures with the lowest snow cover. And they also use Python to stitch these pictures together into this really nice map. But if you think about it, um, the pictures used for the Northern Hemisphere were taken in the summer months in the Northern Hemisphere, like maybe July. And the pictures from the Southern Hemisphere were probably taken from February when it's summer there. So then they're all stitched together and it's still, you know. And also like it's flat. So this edge here is looks really far from the other edge, but actually they're really close together. And uh, yeah, maps can be used to mislead intentionally, like in the case of gerrymandering. Um, politicians like to kind of fiddle with their areas to maximize the chance that they'll be reelected in the future, making these really ridiculous looking <laughs> jurisdictions. And there's a whole book on how to lie with maps, which is which I've read, and it's actually more just to teach you like how to make better maps and how to watch out for things that you might encounter. But overall, the choice of the colors you use, the way you classify different colors, data, um, any aggregation units that you use can make your map tell a different story. But GIS is great. Use it. Use it to understand spatial phenomena, answer spatial questions, and make cool, beautiful visualizations. OK. What kind of schemes? Uh huh. Oh. Oh. Um. I mean, they are official. They have. They're like documented. I don't know if that answers your question. But. Um. So to sum up, maps are great visualizations. There's a lot of things to consider when you're doing GIS. Spatial data is different. We talked about some ways that it's different. And think critically when using maps, because you might, someone might be trying to mislead you. But use GIS to solve problems and make maps. OK, so that's GIS. Any questions about anything I co covered so far? We're turning to Python now. OK. So Python, we're at a Python conference. We know what Python is. It's a general purpose programming language. It's free and open source, which makes it easy to embed into mapping applications. And it has a wide variety of uses. You can build applications with Django or Flask, uh, websites, I mean, 
Um, you can do statistics with it, complex calculations, data science. So Python can be used for GIS, and it's actually embedded in uh, the most popular mapping applications, have a Python installation that comes right with it, and then a Python window that you can open inside of your mapping application. Um, so you can use Python for GIS to extend the capabilities of your mapping applications, use it to build a complex GIS workflow that's repeatable, use it to automate redundant tasks, so you have 10 files that you want reprojected into a, a different projection. You can do that with Python. Uh, and you can use it to integrate maps or spatial data into other applications or even build your own mapping application. There's something called GeoDango used to make a web mapping application with Python. So some libraries that we use for GIS are ArcPy, which is Esri's proprietary um, Python API. QGIS is an open source mapping application that also comes with a Python installation and PyQGIS API. Google has a Google Maps API. And then there's GeoPandas, which we're gonna be using today, free and open source. We're gonna use it inside of Jupyter Notebooks. So this is um, geo-enabled pandas, if you're familiar with pandas. So the tools we're gonna be using today uh, we'll have some spatial data, some shape files that we're going to pull in. We're using Python, three, some Python libraries, GeoPandas, and others. And we're using Conda, um, which I hope you've all y got set up. And then we're going to be doing using Jupyter Notebook as our mapping application. So GeoPandas is an open source project that was designed to make working with geospatial data in Python easier. And it builds upon data types that were created in pandas, um, kind of really trusted data types now. But they, um, they allow spatial operations. Geometric operations are performed by something called Shapely, which we'll import. Uh, and it also depends on Fiona for file access, loading files in. And for plotting, it uses Descartes and Matplotlib. So Conda. Um, you've probably already got it set up, but um, Conda is, if you haven't used it before, it's a package management system and environment management system, so you can activate environments, uh, separated environments. It's tightly coupled with Python installations, Anaconda and Miniconda. And Anaconda and Miniconda are uh, both Python distributions. Anaconda comes with, it's a Python distribution that comes with Conda. It also comes with like a thousand open source data science packages. Um, which is really big, takes a long time to install in and of itself, um, but it's already got so much in it that it creating um, an environment inside of it is probably faster, cause probably because you already have a, most of the things you need. But I had you um, download Miniconda, which is a Python distribution that just has Conda and its dependencies, so that should have been really quick, but then creating the environment took about 30 minutes, some people said, because it, didn't, it ne really needed to install everything from scratch. Jupyter Notebooks are really great. We met one of the core developers earlier. They're an open source web application that allows you to create and share documents that contain live code, equations, and narrative text. And you can use them for data cleaning, um, data transformation, numerical simulation, all kinds of things, including maps and spatial analysis. And we're doing it this way because um, you know, I could open up a mapping application and show you how to do how to use that. That wouldn't be necessarily Python specific. So we're doing it this way partly to use Python, but also that we're creating something that's compact and reproducible. Anyone could download my repo, get set up, and run the exact same code. It's really easy to customize and change. You'll see as you get started. And it's also easy to share your process uh, with non-coders and non-GIS people. Like I could run all the cells in my notebook, give it to my boss, and they'll know exactly what I did without having to know what the code does. OK, so we're ready to get started on our workshop. And I'm going to check the time because we have a break at 10.15. And it's, I know. <laughs> you don't have to tell me. Um, so it's 9.44. Okay, so in half an hour we'll break. But before that, let's get started. So you should have downloaded um, this.
GitHub repo. Download, and you've got it saved somewhere. So to get started, so you should have downloaded the repo and got your Conda environment created. So if you're, if you're at that point, then you'll open up Anaconda like you would any program. And then navigate to the directory where you saved the repository contents. So I'm on Windows, if you are on Mac, you know how to open programs. Um, navigate to the notebook directory, and then once in there, um, oh, we need to activate our environment, so conda activate geo pandas env, and the instructions to activate for Mac and Linux are in the readme. So you'll know your environment is activated because um, it now says GeoPandas ENV right here and before it said base. So now I'm good to go. So now I type in Jupyter Notebook. And it opens up a browser running on localhost 8888 slash my computer name. And now I have access to my three Jupyter Notebooks. Please uh, don't let yourself fall behind if you have problems getting started. Um, are, are you on a Mac? I don't. Someone with a Mac, how do you activate? Um, Help your neighbor if they need it. So we can go ahead and open up this 00, zero Jupyter demo. I am not assuming you've ever used a Jupyter notebook before. Many of you have. So if you have and you're very familiar with them, bear with me a little bit. Um, so this is a Jupyter notebook. Yeah, in the command, I type Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter Space Notebook. And now the command is gone. It's up here. Yeah. So good. I'm, I'm glad Jupyter Notebooks are new to you. I'm really excited to share the fun of Jupyter Notebooks. So if you got this far, you'll see this. Welcome to this Jupyter Notebook. So now this is running, this code is running on your own computer and you have really complete control over what happens now. Um, so just to kind of guide you for through what you're seeing, this is, these are cells. These are all cells. Cells can be either Markdown or Python code and we're running a Python 3 kernel, which you see over here. Um, and to run a cell, you can click the highlight the cell and click run and it'll run the cell and then move you to the next cell. Um, so take take a minute and like kind of look around at the drop down menus. Um, notice I, I made these notebooks, they came downloaded, but you could make a new one if you wanted over here, new Python 3 notebook and you'd get a fresh empty notebook. Uh, so, you know, when I was creating this, I went to new notebook and just started building it. Um, so, you can insert new cells, you can delete cells with cut scissors, you can move cells up and down, um, you can change the type of a cell from code to markdown and vice versa. Um, one thing I did a lot when I was putting this together was I would run all the cells in my notebook just to make sure they all ran fine. You can also clear all the output if you want, which I did before uploading it to GitHub. 
there's some things you can do with the kernel if you start to have issues, restart it or shut it down. So again, to run a cell, you can click the Run button. And then on Windows, I do Control-Enter um, on Mac. Does anyone know the shortcut for running a cell? Shift-Enter. Control. Oh, OK. Cool. So Shift-Enter is, is going to be sim more similar to what I'm going to be doing. But on Windows, I'm doing Control-Enter. So um, so this is kind of just a, a notebook for us to play around with, to get familiar with the notebooks themselves. Um, so go ahead and run some of these cells. Move them up and down just to like see what happens. Add a new cell. Change it to code. Make sure it says code and then run it. So um, I have an intro to Python section in here, and I'm, I think that's going to be pretty redundant for most of you. You're at a Python conference. You know about basic Python data types. So just use this section to kind of just like run through some cells, just see, see what happens when you do various things. Think of it as a command line, but easier to like go back and see what you did. <laughs> Um, note that you get these in, in and out numbers when you run a Python cell. And this notebook is only running stuff in the order that you run it. It doesn't matter what order it's like that I typed it in. So I could run you know, this cell again, and it'll remember everything about my, you know, any variables I've made. These Jupyter Notebooks are so cool. You can load in all kinds of data. You can load in songs and mi movies, analyze like the s sound makeup of a bird song, for example. <laughs> um, we're going to be making maps, but you can also do lots of other cool visualizations and stuff. So yeah, take a few minutes and kind of get comfortable. And if you're not as familiar with Python, you know, read it and like learn about some Python data types. Okay. Um, so I have the section in here, Python and version notes. So we've uh, talked about that. This is a Python Jupyter Notebook. Um, Jupyter, I believe, stands for Julia, Python, and R. Um, so you can run other languages running on different kernels. But and at least, and I think initially it was just Python, Julia, and R. But now there are many other languages you could set up. But you can only run one language at a time, I believe. So we can't run R code in this Python Notebook. We'd have to set it up differently. Um, so I had you download a mini conda with Python 3. Python 3 is the Python of the future, so that's what we're using today. Um, if you're more familiar with Python 2, then there are some differences you should know about. Um, when you divide two integers in Python 2, you would get an integer back. It would just hack off any remainder. But in Python 3, you get a floating point result. And then another thing is Print statements, in Python 2, you could say print space the string. But in Python 3, you need parentheses around that print statement. So, But I, th um, I don't even know if it matters at all for this. Like if you had downloaded Python, uh, mini, kind mini Python with Python 2, it, it might have worked just fine. But I think some of the styling of the charts and maps are actually better with Python 3. So the Jupyter Notebook workflow, um, it r cells run in the order that you run them. It doesn't matter if they're above or below. They run in the order that you run them. Um, so let's say we're going through an exercise, because I have a few little exercises for you. So in this kind of dummy sample exercise, we're creating a variable called x, which is equal to 100. And then we're going through and we're processing it. We're reassigning x to x minus 4. 
and now x is equal to 96, so we're all like working through this together. And then I say, okay, your turn. Now divide x by 2 and reassign it to the variable x. So you do that, except you accidentally divide by 3 instead, and now your x is 32 when the rest of ours is 48. So, you know, what do you do now? You know, are you messed up forever? No. Um, go back to where you initially created your variable. That will kind of start you back to where you were at that point. And then you can run through the cells. This time when it's your turn, you'll divide by the correct number, and then you'll be at 48 with the rest of us. Yes? Yeah, yeah, so that's right. So if we had messed up down here, then we could um, highlight the cell above that we want to run and do cell run all below, and that'll get us back on track. Any questions about how to use a Jupyter Notebook? Pretty cool, right? Okay, so now that we're all familiar with Jupyter, let's get started on GeoPandas, which we'll look at until our break at 10.15. Okay, I'm just gonna close that notebook. You can save it if you want. This is all running locally. You can do whatever you want to these notebooks. We'll go ahead and open up the next one, GeoPandas Intro. Now this is a brand new notebook that doesn't remember anything about our previous notebook, so we're starting from scratch. Um, so to put this intro GeoPandas notebook together, I used a lot of sources, including um, a lot of like just what's in the GeoPandas documentation for this particular notebook. So, you know, you'll fi also find a lot of this information there. Um, so thanks to everyone who made GeoPandas tutorials before me. And I've cited like any sources that I've used throughout. So before we use GeoPandas, we need to import a bunch of things. Matplotlib, Shapely, point objects. Uh, we're importing pandas and GeoPandas, giving them the common aliases, PD and GD, GPD. And we're also gonna explicitly import pan GeoPandas GeoSeries and GeoDataFrame. So run that cell. Okay, first thing we can do is check the versions of the modules we've just imported. So you can see if yours are the same as mine. They should be if you followed the instructions in the README, but even if they're not, I wouldn't worry too much. <laughs> um, but it's always good to know what version of something you're using, so you can check that. So there are two main data structures in GeoPandas and they're called the GeoSeries and the GeoDataFrame, and these are subclasses of the Python series and the Py uh, Pandas series and the Pandas data frame, respectively. So we'll start by creating a simple GeoSeries, which is made up of shapely point objects. We'll assign it the variable GS. So we're, get we're putting in latitude and longitude coordinates into each of these shapely point objects and we're all giving them all as a GeoSeries. So when we type in GS, we get this output showing us we have three of these point objects and we see our coordinates there. We can investigate a little bit about this GeoSeries that we just made, find out what type it is, th what length it is, see that it's a GeoSeries and it has a length of three because we have three shapely point objects in there. Now, just like if I was to tell you, like, I have five, um, you would need to know, like, what units I was talking about, right? Do I have five oranges? Do I have five, five feet length? Or, like, what does that number mean? Uh, so I have to give it um, a coordinate system for it to know, know what to do with the, these coordinates that I've given it. So I'm defining it's the GeoSeries coordinate reference system, CRS, as EPSG4326, which... I don't expect you to remember, is WGS84 lat long. Okay, so now that we've got this set of shapely point objects in a geo series and we've defined the coordinate reference system, we're ready to plot these three points. 
Um, so let's go ahead and plot it. So to make this plot, um, you can just do gs.plot with no nothing inside the parentheses, and you'll still get a plot. But I customized it a little bit. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, x, y. x is longitude, y is latitude. Yeah. Yeah, it's. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. X, but you see x, y in that order and longitude. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. x is longitude, y is latitude. Um, so to plot, I customized my plot a little bit. I gave it a star marker, I colored them red, gave them a marker size of 100, and I defined the figure size as well. And I also limited the plots to the minimum bounds of my data. So that's a GeoSeries. Pretty simple. Um, so then there's the geo data frame, which is like a pandas data frame, but has it's geo enabled, so you can make plots. So to make one of those, and keep in mind that what I'm taking you through right now is kind of some nitty gritty stuff um, about kind of how you would build these data types from scratch. In the future, we're going to be loading in existing data and messing with it. But so if we make a geo data frame from scratch. We can start by making a dictionary called data, and it's got three keys, name, lat, and long. And we've got names for what we want to map, and then three latitudes and three longitudes. So the indexes are going to line up with these. Run that. Got to remember to run my cells. Um, so just to review using dictionaries, which you're, you're probably familiar with, um, dictionaries are key value pairs. So you can get, I have made this dictionary called data. I can pull out all the keys. I can pull out all the values. I can pull out all the values with the key of name. And I can pull out the value at index 1 with the key of name. So there are the results of those. There's also this um, built-in zip method that I'm going to use, which is kind of cool if you have two um, lists or tuples of the same length, you can zip them so that it takes the values at index 0 and puts them into a tuple and the values at index 1 and puts them into a tuple. Um, so kind of a cool built-in method. So I'm going to use um, a list comprehension and that zip method to create a geometry uh, that we're going to use in our, um, our geodata frame. So just created a set of three shapely point objects, and this is going to be the geometry for our geodata frame. And it's just a list of shapely point objects. OK, now we're going to create a geo series using that geometry, geo. And we're going to say the index for each one of those shapely point objects is going to be the, in the same index that the, that the name has. Name is one of the keys in our dictionary. So now we have um, house, location, work, location, pet store, location. Now we'll create a pandas data frame holding our data dictionary. And just showing you um, what data longitude was just uh, a list of longitudes, and now we've turned it into a pandas data frame column. So now we have a pandas data frame. And finally, we can make our pandas geo data frame by plugging in that pandas data frame and assigning geo as the geometry. So now we have a geo data frame that we can plot. And the difference now is that if you add a new cell, and you do g gdf.head to look at the top few rows. Um, so not only do we have the spatial component for our data, but we also have the tabular component.
we know which one is housework and pet store. So that was how to build those two data types from scratch, um, which we won't be doing anymore. Just kind of nitty gritty stuff. So when you installed GeoPandas, you actually got some shapefiles, some data that you can work with right away, installed locally somewhere wherever your GeoPandas stuff got installed. Um, so GeoPandas came with countries data and cities data, which are um, the capitals of every country. So we're going to play with them right now. So it's pretty easy to load in one of these data sets that comes with GeoPandas. We're going to assign the, um, the country's data called natural earth low res. We're going to assign it, load it in, and assign it a variable of world. Now we have that shapefile locally on our computer. Once we load it into this world variable, it's all in the Python memory, and we're not messing with that actual data source. So we could always load it back in, and it would be right as, we, as it was initially. So we can look at the top few rows of our world data and look at what columns. So it's a good idea to kind of, after loading something in, see what you have to work with. So we have, um, these are country boundaries. So we have a name of each country, that's good. We have the continent it's on, we have a population estimate, we have a GDP, and then the spatial component is stored in this geometry column. Okay, so we've loaded it in, it was already a spatial format, we are ready to plot it, and there we go, our first map. So we used the head method to get the top five rows, and we used the plot method to get a map. We can use the, those two things together to get, like, you know, to just show some of the countries. Um, so I can use the head or tail method dot plot, and it'll only show me, like, the top ten countries. You can comment out a few of these, see what happens, just play around with, like, using head and tail to plot, so I'm plotting the top 10. I think these are like alphabetically the top 10 countries. <laughs> so I just, <laughs> just deleted most of the world. Very powerful stuff, so be careful. You can plot um, just a few of the countries by um, sorting on a column. So if I want the top three countries that have the highest population estimate. It'll plot just those th three. I guess these are the countries with the highest population, according to my data. China, India, and the United States. Okay, uh, GeoPandas also came with some cities data called Natural Earth Cities. If you dug deep into your computer, it, you'd find the shape file, but we'll load it in. And just like with our world data, we'll look at the top few rows. So cities data have a name, a name of the city, and a geometry stored in the geometry column. These are points as opposed to polygons. And let's plot with the default. If you just say dot plot, then it'll give you the default styling and everything. So there are cities. So let's customize customize them so that they have the star marker. They're green. We've changed the marker size. And now take a minute, just like maybe paste in this line of code into the next cell and tinker with colors. Obviously, colors are a string, so you kind of have to guess what your options are. Um, Why is it not a, why is Antarctica not a continent? Wh where? Um, maybe I'll talk to you at the break. Yeah, take a minute and make your own little cities plot.
And we're almost at break time. So speaking of Antarctica, the next thing I want to do is calculate the GDP per capita. <coughs> and when I do that with Antarctica, it messes things up because Antarctica, I mean, it doesn't it like has some scientists living on it and they make a fair amount of money, so like it ends up with a really high GDP per capita and we're just not going to bother with it. So we're going to remove it. Goodbye, Antarctica. So I'm finding every every record that has Antarctica in it and I'm Reassigning world to not have any of them in it. And then when we plot that out, Antarctica is gone. And note that now I've created, I've reassigned this world variable. So if we were to go up to our initial world plot and run that cell again, it would be gone. Just that's the work. It that's the workflow. Okay, so I showed you that when our world data had population and GDP columns, so we can create a new column in our data called GDP per capita, and we're gonna set it for every record. It's world GDP divided by population. So we have a new, a new column now that we've just calculated, GDP per capita. So now we can make a map showing the colors or the countries colored by their GDP per capita. So first, um, we'll just find out what our results are, which countries have the highest GDP by um, looking at the top five records, sorting, descending by GDP per capita. So our richest or our highest GDP per capita countries are Qatar, Luxembourg, Norway, Kuwait, and Brunei. And now we can plot, make a map. We're plotting based on that column. So now our countries have a different color based on their GDP per capita. Question? question? Um, so, GeoPandas uses color schemes from Color Brewer. If you click this link, I love this Color Brewer. It is, I use it at my job all the time to find like a good color scheme for something. Um, it lets you pick the number of classifications you want. You know, how many colors do you want? Um, so you can choose, you want five colors or three. Y uh, best practice is no more than five. You can pick the color you want. You can pick if you have diverging um, data, data on either side of zero or sequential. Um, you can choose if you want colorblind safe, etc. So here um, it's telling me I've chosen a five classed Bugern, blue, B U G N. So this is something I could plug into my map, my C map property and that's how it'll color. So I can use this here, say I want greens. I can copy in that greens into my C map property of my plot and it'll map using that color scheme. Uh, it's using Color Brewer, I think. Uh, Color Brewer is pretty famous, so it's a. And okay, so classification schemes are different ways that you can separate your data into classes. So I've got GDP per capita here. I want to separate. I want to group different um, numbers into classes so that I only have five colors. And I'll say like, so the legend might be like. Anywhere from zero to five is this color. Anywhere from five to 10 is this color. Um, and there are different classification schemes that you can use. 
um, equal interval quantiles or Fisher Jenks. So your next exercise is to make the same plot but use a different one of these scheme options and also play around with the colors. And that is our, we're at break time, so I'll let you um, play around with plotting, using different classification schemes, get up, take a break, get a snack. Meet back here at 10.35 for a 20 minute break.
get started. So we kind of rushed through um, the classification scheme thing. So let me just review that really quick. So we were looking at GDP per capita, and we wanted to classify that data so that we only had like five classes on our map, five colors. And there are different ways you can classify data. You can do like 0 to 10, 10 to 20. That's equal interval. Every interval is the same. You can do quantiles, where um, each classification has the same number of data points. So you'll get a lot more variation in your colors that way. And then there's also fisher jenks which I think is kind of like a natural breaks if it's not. Natural breaks is a classification scheme that'll like analyze your data and find natural spots where there's no data and kind of put a break there. So hopefully you've had a chance to make some plots, use some colors from Color Brewer, and change the classification schemes around and kind of see how that affects your output. And you can see how powerful you are now. Like you can make GDP look any different way. <laughs> could make one if you were trying to make one country look richer than it actually is you could probably do that all right so one thing we haven't done yet is well so far we've just mapped our countries on a plot and we've mapped our cities on a plot but we haven't mapped them on the same plot so let's do that next so when we're going to plot multiple layers, and you can plot as many layers as you want on one of these, um, the first thing you do is uh, you take your world plot, however you had it before, and you set it equal to a variable. We're going to set ours equal to base. And then in that same cell, you'll make a plot just like you would before, except you're going to set this axis parameter to your base. So now we have this new thing here. And that's going to plot cities on top of that world base map. Ta -da. So um, just a reminder, if you've used pandas before, it's kind of like, it's like a geodata frame, but just with the data frame. And you can use pandas to make nice bar charts um, and such. So these next two cells are just kind of like showing you that you can do anything with this data that you could with pandas. You can map the highest GDP countries on this kind of chart as well. Because it's all based on pandas. Okay, the last thing in this notebook is going to be on managing projections. And most of this content is right out of the GeoPandas documentation. Um, so we talked about projections in my talk. We, um, we also set a, a coordinate reference system when we made our first GeoSeries. The data that we've loaded in, the world and the cities, it already has a coordinate reference system associated with it, and we can find out what it is by um, doing .crs. So our world is in EPSG 4326, latitude, longitude, WGS 84. That's fine. So let's plot. Let's make a new plot. This time we're going to title. give it a title, WGS 84, lat long, and we'll just plot our world just to see what that projection looks like. So as I mentioned before, this WGS 84 latitude longitude is a spherical coordinate system, so it's not projected. But it's being projected now into a plat carré projection, which is how it often gets projected. But it's defined in latitude and longitude. We can change the coordinate reference system to something else. So I happen to know that the Mercator projection, which is another one we looked at during the talk, is EPSG 3395. So let's change the projection and then plot our world again and see what the difference is. So these look probably pretty different to you, right? You can see that in the plat carré projection above, the upper and lower latitudes are more smushed. And in the Mercator, they're all stretched out. So 
if you go to that epsg.io website, you might be able to find another other projections that you can turn these into. Um, I, I think a fun one just to demonstrate is the polar stereographic projection, which I found the EPSG code is 3995. So let's change our world projection to EPSG 3995 and project again. And we've got the polar stereographic. Very useful, right? Maybe if we were mapping the poles. So just for fun, um, scroll back up to one of your initial world projections and rerun it. It's in polar stereographic now because <laughs> you redefined your world variable. Just any cell where you plotted world will show you. Okay, so we've messed with projections. We've also messed with adding multiple layers to the same map. Your challenge, which I shouldn't give you the answer to, um, is to make a base map in the Mercator projection and then add cities to it. So now we're gonna have a plot in the Mercator projection, give it the title Mercator. It's gonna have the world and the cities. and give you a few minutes. able to get it? <laughs> um, so first, sorry if you're, s if you're still working, you have to change the projection of world, you have to change the projection of cities to be in the same one, 3395 in the Mercator, plot it, set the title, and then do any customizing that you want. And Every time I do this, it has streaky lines through it, and I think it's because um, you we changed the projection to polar stereographic. It messed up some of that internal stuff, and I, l I knowingly left this weird oddity in here because I want you to know, like, spatial data reprojecting different things sometimes can cause weird issues, but it didn't happen the first time, so it's avoidable. You wouldn't usually be. Yeah, and I'm, I'm actually not entirely sure like what exactly it was that caused it. I haven't looked that much into it, but. Yeah, if you, if you go up and reload world, it'll have streaks. <laughs> What's that? Oh yeah, let's fix it, sorry. Okay. Good job, everyone. Any questions on GeoPandas so far? <laughs> so we've now been introduced to many GIS concepts, and now we know how to do some GIS with GeoPandas and Jupyter Notebooks. So now it's time to tackle some real spatial questions in our next notebook. 
So if you're done with this notebook, you can close it, save if you want. So our last notebook, 02 GeoPandas Advanced, go ahead and open that up. So with everything we've learned so far, we're ready to tackle a fun spatial problem. In what cities will we, will we be able to see upcoming solar eclipses? So <coughs> if you're not familiar with what an eclipse is, an eclipse of the sun or a solar eclipse happens when the moon comes between the earth and the sun, blocking off the sun's rays. Um, there was a really well-publicized solar eclipse in 2017. It was on my birthday. I live in Seattle, and I went traveled down to Oregon to see it. It was really fun. So now I'm forcing you all to relive the excitement with me uh, here in this Jupiter notebook. So, um, so I was able to find a bunch of eclipse data, and I've cited my source in the README. I had to. Um, I haven't used. I didn't find like every eclipse forevermore. I found some that will work well for us, which we'll see shortly. So. Um, this is a brand new Jupyter Notebook. It doesn't remember anything that we've um, imported so far, so we have to re-import any modules that we want. And um, I'm not importing some of the things that we don't need anymore. Um, I am importing a new uh, variable called data path, and that's linking to the data directory because that's where I have some data for us to use that was um, downloaded with the GitHub repository. Okay, so um, this Eclipse's shapefile, just um, to show you what that looks like in your file, you'll, you'll be able to find it in your data folder. It's this Eclipse's, there's like, I don't know, seven or eight files called eclipse.something, and these are all, these all make up that shapefile. There are different components of it. One contains the projection, one contains the tabular information, one contains the shape itself. So that's what we're reading in, and this is all downloaded for you locally now. So we load that in, call it Eclipses, and now we have some Eclipses to work with. So best practice after loading in a data set is to look at the top few rows. So those are the top five rows. We have um, probably a lot of columns that we don't need, um, some stuff that kind of came with the data. What we do have is the year. We're going to be using that. We have a year column showing us what year the eclipse happened, will happened or will happen, and then these are stored as polygons. So you're all probably really curious to look uh, look at this eclipse data. But first, I'll just show you. Um, you can also view tabular data with the dot t that'll transpose the columns and rows, which is sometimes helpful. Um, so just see. How that looks now we're looking at the columns on the <coughs> left there. Okay, um, so this shapefile has had a coordinate reference system associated with it, and we can check what it is. It's in EPSG 4326, latitude longitude. So we're familiar with that. That's what our um, our other data was in initially before we reprojected it. Okay, let's go ahead and plot. I know you're dying to see these eclipses. There they are. So these are some eclipse paths in our future. One thing you can do with GeoPandas is find the envelope of all of your data points, and that's like the minimum bounding rectangle around each one. So you can use the envelope method to get these squares around each one, and that might be useful if you're trying to like plot give like a plot bound boundary, like minimum X, minimum Y, that kind of thing. So a little more data exploration. Um, we can look at just the year column in our eclipses and look how many times that number appears in our data. So I've actually cleaned, th cleaned this data up quite a bit and we only have one eclipse for every year that's on record. They're not contiguous years, but we only have one eclipse for every year. Good. Okay, so we plotted out those eclipses. We saw the squiggly lines, but 
Now, what would make that plot more useful if we had a base map below it, right? So we can we have to reload in our world uh, variable with that natural earth low res. The, this is the country data we used in the last notebook. We had to reload it in because it's a new notebook. It doesn't remember anything we did before, and we're gonna style it a little bit differently. Give it a nice the country is a nice light gray color, and the white border is gonna look really nice. So then we'll plot our uh, eclipses on top of that. So that's better. Now we can really see where they are. So I want to look at what cities are inside of these eclipse paths. So what, where can I go to like see one of these? So to do that, we need to load in our cities data again. This is the same city data that we used before, the capitals of each country. So let's make our same plot as above, but now we're adding our new cities on top. So that's cool, but um, we're this data only has the countries. I mean, does anyone see any cities that overlap with any eclipses? Maybe like a few, but like this data set isn't really going to do it for us. We need like a bunch more cities. So I went ahead and downloaded uh, a larger city shapefile, and that's in your GitHub repository. So we're going to redefine cities to point to this new data. It's way more than your capitals. And we've loaded in new data, so we'll take a look at the top few rows. Got a lot of columns, names, a bunch of stuff in here, names in different languages. OK, before we plot, we before we add our new cities to the plot, we need to check the coordinate reference system to make sure it's the same as our other data. And we can use the equals equals to make sure it's the same as the eclipses coordinate reference system, and it is. So what would we do if it wasn't? Reproject it. Then we could. It was already in the right one, so that's good. OK, so now we're running the same exact code, but now we have our new cities data. And that's a lot more to work with, right? Lots more cities. So let's play around with the style of our plot. Um, the for eclipses, let's say we want to change the CMAP property to tab 10. This is going to assign all the years a random number, a random color. And alpha is going is saying the transparency that you want the eclipses to show up as. So if I give that a value of 0.5, they'll be 50% transparent on the plot. So now they're colored based on year, and they're partly transparent, and that looks pretty cool. Feel free to play, play around with these settings as we go. You could change the tab 10 to some other color brewer color scheme. Actu <laughs> that is interesting. We are not removing Antarctica now, this time. It's sticking around. <coughs> yeah, and if at any point you don't like the way my plots look, you can change them. This is all up to you now. Right, with tab 10, it's saying random colors, so it doesn't, it's not using any column, actually. Yeah. Um, I think it's repeatedly random, yeah. Yeah. They look the same every time. Okay, we can look at the years that we have data for. So we've got 2017 last years and then a few upcoming ones, 19, 20, 21. 
So that's nice, but we want to know like which of these years goes with which eclipse, right? So we need a, a legend showing us. Now we can easily see which eclipse goes with which year. And to do that, I um, did the legend equals true on my eclipses. And I gave it the year column. But that legend is covering up some of our map, so we can um, redraw our figure, but move the legend off to the side. And I kind of tinkered with these numbers until it kind of got off my map. So yeah, personal preference. I wanted it kind of like just off the map, the stuff. Okay, so our city's data had um, population inside of it, so we can use it to answer fun questions like, which one of these eclipses will cover the largest population? And then we can make a map of it. Um, so the way I went about that was I um, used sjoin, and I'm querying all the cities that are inside of any eclipse path. So I'm filtering out anything that's not inside of an eclipse path. <coughs> and I'm calling that all E cities. So these are all my eclipse cities in tabular format. Probably didn't need to print them all out. I'm reassigning all E cities to just be the pop max and the year. So pop max is a column in my cities table. There was like a pop min as well, but they were usually the same exact number. So I'm just pop max is the population of each city. So now each city has each of this, this data itself has a, a year that the eclipse covered and a uh, population for e the city. Now I can use uh, group by to say for all those years, uh, group each year into, the into one row and add up all of the populations that were associated with that year. And I'm just assigning it to a temporary variable because I'm going to join it back to my eclipses data. So we have this variable g that is telling us the year of the eclipse and then the total sum of every city that it covered. So I have this, this g data. I want to add it back to my eclipses so that I have that spatial component back. Right now this is just a you know, just this structure you see here, there's no spatial component, so I need to join it back to my eclipse data based on the year, and then I'll have eclipse data, spatial data, and I'll also have this population. So I'm using uh, pandas merge, um, joining on the year, And if I look at my results, I have my eclipses data again, the year, and a population. The year was already there, but now I have a population for each one. Now we can use that the same um, methods that we used in the previous notebook to make a choropleth map where each eclipse is colored by the population. 
So now we know which ones are going to be the cover the most people. And this kind of makes sense. Like, there's an eclipse down here that's like almost transparent because there aren't that many people living in the path there <laughs> in Antarctica or in the ocean. Um, this one here is also pretty light, just not covering that much land. But um, these ones here covering a lot of people. So checks out. And I wasn't able to figure out how to get the um, eclipse years here in the legend along with the population, unfortunately, but you can still like print that out separately. So you have the year of the eclipse and then the population it covers and then you have the map. Yeah, and again, if you don't like my colors, you know how to change your mind. Um, I, as far as the eclipse paths, yeah, I downloaded them from um, NASA indirectly and then cleaned them up and compiled them. Exactly, and that's another one reason I kind of like this data set is because I want everyone to remember that the Earth is round, and that's why <laughs> some of these paths look really funny. They're like fat, fat and kind of wonky at the poles because of the projection. Okay, so this, e this eclipse might be the highest population going through the United States uh, in the year 2024. So be in the path. Another question we can ask is, are there any eclipses passing over Cleveland or any other cities specifically? Um, so I, the way I answered that question was to take my city's data. Cleveland is in there along with a lot of other cities. So I just queried it out into a, a variable called my city. And then I'm, um, I'm using sjoin again just to see if it intersects with any eclipse in my data set. And I wrote a function here to make it a little bit more flexible in giving me the results so that you could theoretically plug in your own city and see what the results are. So um, if any cities interact intersect, then it'll give me a nice message. And if they don't, it'll also give me a message. So if I uh, call that function, I get a result. One eclipse will pass through Cleveland in the year 2024. And I believe that was the one that had the highest population as well. So we can um, assign that eclipse to a variable so that we can plot out just that one. And I'm, I'm doing this, I've got a lot of if else's in here um, in the hopes that you'll be able to try this with your own city, um, whether it has or doesn't have an eclipse in it. So I've got my eclipse, my eclipse city in their own variables, and now I can plot giving lots of, I'm using lots of my own customizing stuff to make a very special plot for Cleveland and its upcoming eclipse. So are there any eclipses passing over your city? find out by <laughs> changing Cleveland to your own city and <laughs> if it overlaps with a city in the city's data, you'll probably get a result. Yeah, give it a try. I, I live in Seattle, so I run these cells again. No eclipses passing through Seattle. Okay. 
they're, a, they're the totality of a solar eclipse. Anyone get a positive result? I mean, oh, one, two, one. Yeah, I mean, chances are it won't, you won't get any, but, <laughs> but Cleveland, <laughs> Cleveland had one. Cleveland is like right in the middle of that path, so. We're in a good place. Just stay here until 2024, and then you're good. Okay. So now um, I'm leaving it up to you. You can choose an eclipse that you want to map. Specifically, we're gonna. You're each gonna choose. Choose whichever one you want to look at more closely, and then we'll see what cities are falling inside of that one. So to look at our options again, um, here's the list of <coughs> years that eclipses pass through. And um, we'll plot again just so that you are reminded about which year is associated with which eclipse, so you can pick whichever one of those look interesting to you, take note of the year in which it's going to happen. And then in the next cell, you're gonna say, my eclipse is equal to whichever eclipse that you wanna model. And last year's was on my birthday, so I'm gonna stick with that one. So instead of 2017, you'll plug in Whichever one of these looks most fun, and you want to know where you could go to see it. Okay, um, so plot it out. Now, at this point, your stuff is going to look different than mine, unless you chose the same eclipse that I did. Um, so, yeah. You should just see your, your eclipse on this map now. And that's cool. Um, but we kind of want to zoom in on our, our data, right? So um, in the next cell, I've added X lim and, and Y lim. So we're calculating the minimum bounding box of your eclipse, whichever one you chose, it's going to work. Um, and then center the map on that. So run that again. Run this cell, and now you should have it focused right on yours. Everyone good? Um, yeah. I'm not sure. Okay, now I want you, this is your eclipse now um, and your plots. So I made a plot that looks a little nicer to me, but take a, take a few moments and like think about what does an eclipse look like to you? <laughs> like how, what, would, what would you expect to see on a map? Um, like to me, they look kind of dark and shadowy with a yellow boundary. So that's what I styled mine on, but. And you can make your eclipse more or less transparent with the alpha property. Change the color of cities to whatever you think they should be. So your exercise here is to make your eclipse look eclipsier. Okay, so we're about to do some spatial analysis on the cities and the eclipse paths. So again, we want to make sure that they have the same coordinate reference system. 
because we've done some processing. I don't know, maybe something got messed up. Um, so we'll just do a quick check and make sure that the data are in the same CRS, which they are. 4326, also known as? Yes, it's what GPS, GeoJSON use, latitude, longitude, WGS84. Okay, so you should have a kind of a good idea that I know there are some cities that, that intersect with every eclipse, so, and I can see that there are a few in mine. So, um, but to find out for sure, and to get the exact list, we need to do uh, the S join again, which we've done a few times already in this notebook, to get the cities that are inside of my eclipse, I'm gonna intersect. We'll assign that to a variable E cities, and then look at the top few rows. So here are some cities that intersect with my eclipse. Ontario, Lander, Kansas City. And now let's plot. Okay, so I filtered out any city that wasn't in my path and it's now assigned to a new variable. And I could plot out, I could look at all the records in, <coughs> I'm just looking at the top five records in my eCities variable, but I could print them all out and get a, a complete list of cities that I could go to see this eclipse. And let's <coughs> print out some nice messages. Okay. How many cities were in your path? I got 39. Anyone get more than that? Yeah? Nice. Oh yeah, that's the high one. Cool. Oh wow. Cleveland is the third most populated city in that path. Nice. Okay, so there's some really fun stuff. We can continue to do to visualize this information in the Jupyter Notebook. Um, we're gonna add this data onto a slippy map and we'll be able to move it around right in the Jupyter Notebook. Um, but before we do, I'm gonna go back to my slides and tell you a little bit more about base maps. Okay, so we're about to, we've all been using these static plots and now we're gonna make dynamic maps inside of the Jupyter Notebook. Um, but um, some things to know before we do that are that the data that we're using um, that's gonna be our base maps for our, um, for the maps we're about to use are, I believe all the data is from OpenStreetMap. And OpenStreetMap is a collaborative project to create a free and editable map of the world so it's like Google Maps in that it's a web map and you can search for stuff and zoom in and out and pan around, but it's like Wikipedia in that it's completely community sourced and you can contribute to it. Um, you can take data out of it and use it for anything as long as you cite your source. Um, so it's important to recognize what this is because this is the data behind the maps we're gonna be using. So, um, it's op openstreetmap.org. Go ahead and open that up. Mine thinks I'm still in Seattle. But, okay, so you can see it's a, it's a web map, but you know all the data that is behind the scenes here has been contributed for free by users. Um, and we, at, um, at map time, every um, every year we all get together and like have contribution parties and stuff and there are a lot of other groups that I know of that like will get together and like add a bunch of data. So it's a really cool thing. So we're gonna be able to use this map inside of our Jupyter Notebooks and put our Eclipse data on top of it. Um, but I just wanna show you a little bit about like what makes up one of these maps. I mean, they're all data-based but then 
they get um, turned into these things called tiles. What you're looking at right now is a set of seamed together tiles. And um, let me see if I. So um, these base maps are made up of regularly sized square 256 by 256 pixeled images. Um, so if you've ever like opened a web map, zoomed in and out real quick, and maybe some squares were missing for a second, that's why it was like waiting to load that picture. And this image kind of gives you a good visualization of what's what is happening. Um, so these. Um, these tiles cover the entire map area without gaps or overlaps. And you can actually make your own base map tiles. Uh, they're just like way easier, uh, quicker to load in a browser than like actual vector data. And we can um, look at some of these tiles directly. Um, if, you if you go to OpenStreetMap again, um, open up in whatever browser you're using. I'm using Chrome, and I'm going to Developer Tools. So it's probably different for different browsers, but um, I click the Network tab, and then if I pan around on my map, I see these like number.png here, and these are tiles that got loaded since, they needed to get loaded since I was panning to a new area that I hadn't been to yet. If you right click on any of these and open in a new tab, make sure you're clicking on something called like number.png, open it in a new tab and you'll see, you know, the, pit, the tile itself. So this is what um, Google Maps and OpenStreetMap are made of are these base map tiles. Anyone get get some tiles? So I have a little exercise. That's one exercise is to just call tiles and open them up. Um, so tiles are identified by their X column and the Y row, two identifiers, and then a Z, which is a zoom level, um, because if you zoom way out so that you see the whole world, that's real it's just one tile. And you zoom in, then you see four. And you zoom in, it's like it grows um, exponentially every time you zoom in, the number of tiles that are needed, because they're all the same size of image. Um, so zoom level zero is like the whole world, and zoom level 17 is like way zoomed in. So a web map like this has a lot of tiles, and I wrote a little Python script to tell me how many. Um, so that's, if there are 20 zoom levels, 0 to 20, that's, I don't even know how to say that number, but. So um, web maps like have tile caching systems set up because that's a lot of images to deal with, but that's actually way faster than it would be to like load in vector data as, as a user is looking for it. So um, I have a little exercise uh, for you to call three different um, map tiles from OpenStreetMap. So you can pick a place in the, in the Northern Hemisphere, um, your favorite place, find its coordinates. You can Google your location and find its latitude and longitude. And then you can find the tile containing your location for lev zoom levels 5, 10, and 15. And you need this tool um, to help, which my former colleague made. So I'll, sh I'll show you how to do this. So first, you'll take a tile. If you loaded one already, you just need like the format. So um, we're looking at this tile URL. This thing in between, right after the .org slash, is the zoom level. And then the next number after the next slash is the x. And the next number after that is the y. So you need this kind of format, and you also need this page, which I linked to in my slides, use this to help. Um, so first you need to identify the location you want to get the tiles for, and then plug the X and Y into this URL. 
So if you Google Cleveland lat long, it'll give you, you'll find quickly find lat long. Plug in latitude that you find here and the longitude that you find here, and then refresh that page. Then using a, any sample tile URL, plug in the Z value um, for five, and then the X and Y values, and then you should get, it should return to you a tile at your location. Does that make sense? And then do the same for 10 and 15. It's uh, either a, b, or c dot tile dot openstreetmap dot org slash z slash x slash y. Found a few. Just zoom in a little more each time on wherever you chose. <laughs> That's another thing to notice is like the more you zoom in, the map style in your tile is going to be a little bit different, optimized for that zoom level. So I chose Madrid, Spain. And then still need time? Um, A, B, and C, I think, are like different, I don't know, like the, yeah, servers running. But now you know when you look at any of these web maps, this is this is what you're seeing these images stitched together. Um, this is one twenty. Yeah, I. This is like a bonus. <laughs> okay, everyone, good. Find a few. Okay, now we're ready to go back to our notebook. Okay, so we've been working with uh, eclipses and the cities inside of our path. Um, now, in order to make, in order to plot basically um, 
you know, our eclipse data on top of a map like this, and also the cities that it, um, oh, look, you can see the tiles loading. Um, we need to import something called Folium, a new module that's going to give us access to um, these space maps. So go ahead and import that. And then I've, uh, I've customized this notebook so that no matter what eclipse you choose, the, the, the remainder of the content here is going to focus on yours. So we need to set X and Y um, as the area that our folium maps are going to start zoomed in on so that, you know, you don't have to go around looking for your eclipse. It's going to be right there in the center when you load it. So we'll make our X and Y as the centroids of your eclipse. And it'll print them out. So this is my centroid. Yours will be different. OK, so we've got a lot of really cool base maps, some of which um, were ones that I showed you before with the stamen. The there's like a watercolor map, and uh, stamen has a lot of fun maps. These are based on OpenStreetMap data, I believe. I have a little link in here to folium map tiles that you can click on, and there are um, some examples. Is this going to work? So um, anyway, as you're going forward and working, um, doing any additional work or customization on this, um, take a look at that and see what your options are. I'm going to show you a lot of different base maps here, like basically a new one every cell because there are a lot of really cool ones. So we're just going to start with um, a basic OpenStreetMap tile. And to create that, I'm making a variable called map underscore OSM is folium.map, giving it the uh, starting centroid with my location. And a zoom level to start with. We know about zoom levels now, so you could change this uh, number. A zoom level 3 is pretty zoomed out, but you could change it to like 17, and your map's going to be way zoomed in to start. Go ahead and play with that if you want. So this is just uh, this is basic OpenStreetMap tiles right here in our notebook. There's nothing, no layers on top of it yet. We're just kind of seeing what base map options we have. Remember, we're still in the Jupyter Notebook, and yet we're dragging this around, which is really cool. Oh, do note that um, when we were using GeoPandas and we were plotting, all of our plots were in WGS84. But when you are using base map tiles, you are at the mercy of whatever your base map tiles were created in, and these are going to be in Web Mercator. So whether you like it or not, you're in Web Mercator now. OK, um, another base map option is Carto DB Positron. And it's still like black and white, grayscale. Um, yeah, take a look. See if it, you think it suits you. And my favorite is the stamen watercolor base map. Um, it's really pretty and completely worthless for professional uses. So I like to use it at times like this when it doesn't matter. I can just show you whatever I, I can do whatever I want. So, so this one's really pretty. This is my favorite. So I'm going to use this one. But um, you. Um, so they're made by companies like Stamen and CartoDB, but they're using OpenStreetMap data. They're just creating these map tiles using their own styling. And then I'm calling them, like, they, these are coming in from the internet. So. Mm -hmm. You have to stay with Web Mercator if you're using the folium base maps because as I, sho I showed that they're all these square tiles, that's, that's it. That's how they are. If you're going to use them, you have to use. They're already, as far as I know. OK, the next step is to add our cities and our eclipse path to 
um, to the map. And I'm, I'm using um, the same stamen watercolor map. And I'm also adding a layer control, folium.layer control. Add that, and there we go. So you should see a map of your eclipse and your cities. And this little thing up here is a uh, leaflet layer control. Leaflet is a JavaScript mapping library that this is using somehow. So you can turn your cities on and off, your eclipse path on and off. Now you might be wondering, well, these cities, these city points are cool, but like, what are they? There's no labels. You can't really see. So in the next cell, um, I went through an example of how you could add pop-ups to your map. Because this kind of map doesn't do labels very well. It doesn't do custom labels very well. Maybe you can do it. I don't know. But it does, it can do pop-ups. Um, so to make pop-ups for the cities, I wanted, to, I wanted to be able to hover over each city and know what th the name of the city was and the population. That'll help me figure out where I want to go to see the eclipse. So I made a function, um, define my map. I'm using yet another set of base map tiles. This is Tecarto DB's Dark Matter, so we're going to get a whole different base map. Then I'm going to add my eclipse to that map. But I have to do cities a little bit differently. Instead of adding, um, doing folium.geojson and adding my cities like a layer, I'm making a for loop for every city. I'm generating some pop-up text for it. And then I'm placing it at a, at a marker on the map. So we're kind of losing our connection to like the city's layer itself. Instead, we're going through for every city, we're generating this little circle and a pop-up for it until we're done. And that is a function that we'll generate by running that cell. And then we'll call the function create another map. This time I've got these circle markers for my city and if I click on one it'll tell me what the city name is and the population. And you'll note that here in my layer control I don't have cities anymore because I kind of like took them out instead of having the city's layer all of it I turned them all into these like map marker circles. So I can still turn the eclipse path on and off. And now now you can see pretty clearly lots of information about where where you can go to see your chosen eclipse. So um, so we now have this my eclipse variable that's just got your whatever eclipse you chose, and then we have eCities, which is um, just the cities that are inside of your path. If you wanted to save those as a shapefile, that's pretty easy. You can uh, uncomment out these last two lines of the next cell, and then you'll have that data for you to load into another application and use later if you want. But I, I had it commented out because like, it was making new files all the time as I was <laughs> kind of putting this together. So. And yeah, so you can save, save those if you choose. If you do save them, they'll be in your data directory wherever you save the repository. OK, and that is um, the prepared content I have. So you've got, we've got some time here. You've got a lot of new skills. Um, I need to think about like if you wanna if there's something like that you were curious about and wanna try, make a, a map of a different eclipse. Um, 
choose, choose a base map, like use this time to make your own kind of custom map using everything we've learned today. And I'll be hanging around to help. You've got the environment already set up, this Jupyter notebook here, so. Yeah, it's like uh, routing. Um, yeah, a little bit. Um, as far as open source tools, like I, I don't know any off the top of my head, but that'd be something we could look at. This last cell shows you all the eclipses on a sticky note. Yeah. So take some time, make a custom map. I'll be here. Because it's slippy. Yeah, so you have uh, some zip code data already. It's already a shape or some kind of spatial format, and you want to group them together. Um, so y um, I mean, you could use a mapping application like QGIS, or you could probably use Jupyter Notebook too. But um, for kind of a simple application that's really visual, um, you might want to download QGIS, load in your data, and then you could like select the ones that you want to group. And it would there would be a pretty like accessible tool you could use to do that. Other questions? Okay. Thanks.